Today, uh, we want to continue to take a look at some of the questions that you all have submitted. And our question today has three parts to it. So we want to dive right into this topic of being able to utilize the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 1. We're going to start there. And... Uh, sorry, Acts chapter 2, and take a look at some of these gifts and acts of the Spirit. So the question is, are speaking in tongues, praying in spirit, and speaking things into existence biblical? And so for some of you, this may be a question that you've had yourself. Some of us, it may be the first time you've ever even asked these questions or heard these questions. And so I want to kind of give an overview. I won't go extensively into each one of these areas. Uh, we could do a whole discussion series on all of these things. But I figured that today I felt like we could cover these three and give at least a solid base understanding of what is given in the Bible. So Acts chapter 2, let's take a look, verses 1 through 4. Just a pretext of where we're at with the scriptures and the story. Jesus Christ has uh, died on the cross. Uh, he has resurrected. And the disciples were told to go and wait to receive the Holy Spirit. So they have gone into a area of town and they've gone into the upper room and they're waiting. And this is the day that we come on in chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So the very first thing, the question is, what is speaking in tongues? So this is the primary verse and passage that most people will reference when talking about speaking in tongues. Maybe you've heard this phrase before, you didn't know what it was. Maybe you grew up in a particular uh, denomination or background that speaking in tongues had a different uh, connotation. But biblically speaking, uh, this is what we see Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In Acts chapter 10, there's a couple of different times in the book of Acts that we see that the Spirit moves in people this way. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 and 46, uh, the, the pretext or the context of this particular passage, Peter, who is on mission to go and share the gospel, is called by God to go to Gentiles non-Jews. And he's called to the house of Cornelius and God gives him a vision that he should share the gospel not just with Jews but with all mankind. So in verse 44 we read a part of this story. Peter sharing the gospel with the people at the house of Cornelius. It says while Peter was still speaking these words the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Just footnote, verse 45, when he says that the circumcised believers, they're talking about Jews. So the Jewish believers, some of those who had been there back in Acts chapter 2, that had received the Holy Spirit when he poured out on the believers that day. They were with him and they were astonished that they, it poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Finally, uh, one last time, Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, 1 through 7, this is a story where Paul is going out, and he is sharing with people who believe in Jesus, and he shares this story. In Acts 19, we read that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. 
There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So these are believers in Jesus Christ, believers that he was the Messiah, but they had not heard the entire story. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Verse 4, Paul says, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in one coming after him, and that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So we see here in Acts, there's a couple of different times where the Holy Spirit moves on people, and in that movement, the result of that is tongues. And there's a very good explanation that we read back in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, explains that these tongues, what we call tongues, it's translated as the word tongues in English. In the original Greek, the word was languages. So you could substitute the word languages for tongues, and it would fit grammatically, and it would be biblically accurate to say that the Holy Spirit moved on people, and they were able to speak languages. Example, Acts chapter 2, verse 5. After the Holy Spirit moved on them and they had spoke out in, in front of other people, verse 5 it says, Now staying there in Jerusalem were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came around in bewilderment because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all speaking Galileans? Let me just insert explanation. What they're saying there, aren't they a bunch of hicks? Right? Aren't they, if we could use them in southern Indiana vernacular, aren't they from Chandler? <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it, it just was like, wait, the, they're, not the, they're not from Yale, they're not from Harvard, right? Uh, they're from Galilee. I'm just reading scripture, guys. <laughs> just reading scripture. <laughs> Verse 8. <laughs> we'll get back to scripture. Then how is it that each of them hears their own native language and it goes in a list of these different areas of the Roman Empire that they were all from and it says that they were amazed and perplexed so what can we derive from this I think it's very clearly that what is being done here is that the Holy Spirit enabled the people there on the day of what we call the day of Pentecost uh, what is happening here is that in ancient Israel, there were certain feasts and festivals that required people, no matter where you were from, across the, the nation of Israel or around the world, that God asked that you come back to his chosen place, Jerusalem, at the temple to worship. And Pentecost was one of those times. And so what has happened here is that you have people from all around the Roman Empire who spoke a many, many different languages. And they hear this commotion going on, and they come around, and they hear people praising the Lord, and they're astonished because what they hear is not just some Galileans praising God in Hebrew or Aramaic, but they're hearing them speak Egyptian and Greek and Latin and all down the road of all the different languages that are spoken around the world. So when we ask the question, what is speaking in tongues, I think biblically speaking, it is speaking in known languages. In other words, languages that other people can understand. Now with that as a context, let's move on and see. It has purpose is the next thing. It has purpose. Here's a couple of the things that we can, in these passages, see 
that God has purpose for speaking in tongues. Number one is evangelism. In Acts chapter tw 2, verses 11 and 12, it, the people who gathered around says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? God allowed the people there on the day of Pentecost to speak into the lives of those around them. Does this happen today? Yes, it can. And there are stories that if you do a little research where people go into foreign countries, foreign lands, and are able to communicate, moved by the Holy Spirit, and the message is delivered in a way so that people can understand them. God allowed the disciples to have tongues, to have the supernatural power of speaking foreign languages for the purpose of evangelism. The people heard the wonders of God and praised them and were perplexed and were inquisitive as to what was going on. How can they engage with this God? In Acts chapter 10, in the story with Peter, we see that this was confirmation that the gospel is for everyone. God specifically sent Peter to Cornelius' house, a non-Jew, a Gentile, and gave them and demonstrated to them the power of the Holy Spirit through speaking in tongues so that not only Peter and not only Cornelius' home but all those who were there, remember it says the circumcised Jews who were there with him, the people who were already believers in God through Judaism, who now believe in Jesus, they were amazed because they said, look, even the Gentiles get the Holy Spirit. It, we can unpack it throughout the book of Acts in the New Testament. We, we see this tension between those who were First believers because they were Jewish, and then those who were not Jewish, they're like, what does it mean to be a believer? Do I have to be a Jew and then a believer, or can I just be a believer? Paul deals with this a lot through his books, but here's one of those times where God is confirming his Holy Spirit, his salvation is not just for the nation of Israel, but for all the world. Again, does every person who receives Christ and believes in him receive speaking in tongues as a gift. No, we do not see that in the New Testament. But in this particular circumstance, it was a confirmation that the gospel was for everyone. And then later in Acts chapter 19, when Paul explained to people what the message of Jesus Christ was, it gave a completion of understanding. You see, they the believers that he had engaged with there in Acts 19 had been baptized by John. If you remember when Jesus was here on earth, his cousin John the Baptist preceded him, pronouncing as a proclaimer of truth, there is one who's following me who is greater yet. I baptize you in water, but he will baptize you with fire. In other words, there is one who's coming who's true salvation. And last week, if you were with us at Freeman Park, we unpacked the whole idea that we are secure in that salvation through Jesus Christ because unlike the other prophets, unlike the other priests, when Jesus completed his sacrifice on the cross, he sat down and was completed. The work is done. His salvation is greater. John's baptism was just a repenting. But then if you got baptized, then you would have to be rebaptized re because you continually sin. But Jesus' baptism is eternal. And so he demonstrates to them and gives them a completion of understanding. And as a seal, as a sign that they understood, the Holy Spirit poured on them this gift of speaking in tongues. So here in the New Testament, these are the primary passages that we can see where God did move in the New Testament, in believers' lives, and gave them the supernatural gift of speaking in other languages. It had purpose. Next, we want to see that there's a biblical guideline for speaking in tongues. Paul does address this issue of speaking in tongues. 
we have to recognize not everyone has the gift. Not everyone receives this particular spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Corinthians 12, 11 says, all these, speaking about the acts of the Spirit, all these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and he distributes them to each just as he determines. Paul's writing here to the church of Corinth, and he says, look, some of you will have this gift, some of you will have other gifts. Not everyone receives all the gifts. In fact, we read a little bit later in that passage, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and 30, God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, guidance, all the way down the list it says, then different kinds of tongues. Paul goes on to ask the question, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? It's a rhetorical question because the answer, of course, is no. No. As far as I know, there has only been one human being that enveloped all of those concepts. His name was Jesus. No one else has ever done that. Our greatest biblical heroes that we can look at in the New and Old Testament had many abilities and gifts, but none of them had all of it. To think that just because it is a particular spiritual gift that everyone is supposed to have it, I would say the answer is no. Not everyone has this particular gift. If there is speaking in tongues, Paul very clearly gives us instructions that there is to be interpretation. In other words, it has to be understood. It cannot be for lack of a better term, gibberish, ramblings. It has purpose. Anytime we see that the Spirit moves and acts in any spiritual gift, it is not to bring glory to the person who the spiritual gift is coming through, but in order to go back and give glory to either Christ or to God the Father. And so we look in 1 Corinthians 14, In 1 Corinthians 14, he's explaining that there's purpose and there's unity and there's instructions on how that we are to conduct ourselves as Christians. He, I'm just going to read a couple of different sections of verse, uh, chapter 14. He says, For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Just stop there for a second. If you see that somebody is speaking in tongues or for people who propose you to speak in tongues so that they themselves receive glory or they themselves receive honor, this is a direct violation of this particular verse. Anyone who receives the gift of tongues does so because they're speaking on behalf of God and to God. Indeed, no one understands them, for they utter mysteries by the Spirit. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongue. The word prophesy here in the original language here, it has two meanings. One is both a declaration of things yet to come. In other words, I prophesy that today you guys will go to lunch, right? That's a prophecy, but also a prophecy of speaking God's truth. God says this, a declarative statement on God's purpose. Paul's writing, he says, it is greater for those people than it is to speak in tongues, unless someone there is to interpret, so that the church may be edified. Notice that even in that passage, Paul's saying, look, if you speak in tongues, someone needs to be there to explain what's being said, and that message needs to edify. That edify means to build up, to expand, to enrich the church. Not the person not that person's position, power, or anything else, 
but the church. And if the church is edified, the ultimate goal of the church edifying itself and being lifted up is to what? Bring glory to God. So we're still back to that biblical principle. If there's tongues, it is to bring glory to God. Paul goes on to say, if I do not grasp the meaning of what someone's saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker. And the speaker is a foreigner to me. If you've ever had the opportunity to travel outside the United States or someplace where English is not the primary language being spoken, and you are a foreigner, you see people engaging in life, doing things, and it seems foreign to you. You do not know. You feel like you're left out. Paul's saying if it's a person who's just speaking in tongues and just kind of going on about things, he is not receiving that information. It's like being a foreigner. Paul goes on to say in chapter 14, try to excel in those things that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he or someone else may pr interpret what they say. For no more than one or two of you should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time, and someone must interpret what they say. Paul's saying right here is that it can't be chaos. There's an order to this thing. But if someone is present who can interpret, they must silent, be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues. If no, I'm sorry, if no one is present who can interpret, then they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. So I will just say this. The biblical principle, I believe, for speaking in tongues is that not everyone has the gift. But if someone has the gift, it is to be used to glorify God. Meaning that if they speak, someone has to interpret, because if they're speaking, they should be speaking on behalf of God and God's word and edifying the church and bringing glory to God, not themselves. Now, there's much more that could be said, but I believe that that gives us a basis. If you've ever been in a discussion about tongues, I feel like you could have a biblical foundation to say, yes, they happened, yes, they have a purpose, and the Bible gives us clear instructions on what that purpose is and how that they're to be conducted so that if you're in a situation where people are quote unquote speaking in tongues or promoting speaking in tongues and it doesn't follow the biblical guidelines you can tell whether it's authentic or not it's easier to show you the one true way and let you discern the falsehoods than it is to go through the myriad of false ways. Make sense? What is it about tongues? I hope that this answers the question. The next part of the question is, what about praying in the Spirit? Is there a biblical reference for that? Yes. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. Paul says, I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing words that I understand. One thing that I want us to see, both like it is in the case of speaking in tongues and praying in the Spirit, it is an understandable act. It is something that can be understood and processed. Paul writes in Ephesians 6.18, and part of the understanding of spiritual warfare, he says, I pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. And then finally, Jude 20 says this, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. All right, side note just a biblical principle I want you to pick up on already today. Anytime that you're presented with a question, this is my principle that I go to, I learned it from someone else, but I pass it on to you. If somebody comes to you and says, well, what about this or what about that? Always, if possible, go to Scripture and see and find if they have a reference to those things or an occurrence of that thing. So if someone asks you, 
there's usually generally two things about tongues. Either they, people are for it or they act like it never existed. That's not true. Obviously, it existed because we see it in Acts and we see it through the New Testament. S praying in the Spirit is a term that's used in New Testament. Now, I think that it's been used incorrectly in modern teachings, and we'll, do, we'll go over that here in just a second, but I want us to see that there's a biblical principle. Yes, there were speaking in tongues, and the Holy Spirit was alive then. The Holy Spirit is alive today. He will always be alive, and he acts very much the same today as he did back in the day. That's important for us to understand because if Paul is saying and instructing those in Ephesus and in Corinth and Judah saying to the believers of the first century, you should pray in the Spirit, we who now, some 2,000 years later, if the Holy Spirit is the same today as he was yesterday and will be tomorrow, we can then also practice these things to pray in the Spirit. So next we see that there should be clarity and purpose to praying in the Spirit. Again, I feel like too many times that this term and phrase and act is used as a attention grabber for the one, quote unquote, praying in the Spirit. Often that I've seen this used in modern context, it's look at me, I can do this special thing. But that's not what God teaches in his word. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. I don't know if you've ever had a situation in your life where you have sat down to pray and there just are no words for your prayer. The depth of the pain, the heaviness of the situation... Your, your, your mouth, your mind just can't conceive of things. But in your heart, perhaps, you've experienced this. There were out of that springs up words and thoughts and images of expressing to God what it is that's in your spirit. If you've ever experienced that, that is what I believe this passage is talking about. Paul writing in Romans 8 that the Holy Spirit speaks on our behalf, moves on us. And often I find myself when I cannot pray, not only does things come up in my heart, but those things usually are scriptures or songs. Which is why it's important for us to be in the word and to put into our mind and in our spirit and in our hearts those things which later we can draw on. Paul says that the Holy Spirit moves through us, will speak for us. In Corinthians, Paul writes, I will pray in the Spirit, I will also pray words that I understand. Again, reiterating this idea that when we do pray, the purpose of prayer is that it can be understood. It is no good to me if the Holy Spirit... Prays in me, through me, for me, and I don't understand it. Clearly, Paul is writing that if you pray in the Spirit, it is something that can be understood. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, when he says to pray, it's a continuation of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, which says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities of darkness. In other words, what I believe is that we see that Paul is commanding us that prayer, particularly praying in the Spirit, is a spiritual act because that is where the warfare takes place. And there are times when we are weak, but the Holy Spirit, who is our protector, will step in for us. So what Paul, I believe, is commanding us to pray in the Spirit it's because he's asking God to take care of the spiritual things in our lives because we physically cannot do it. Our prayer life is our spiritual warfare. And sometimes when we go into that warfare, we need the heavy hitters to come along. 
And that's why I believe Paul is saying we pray in the Spirit. We let the Holy Spirit pray through us, for us. He is our protector, our shield. He goes before us. He comes behind us. He surrounds us. He protects us. Finally, in Jude chapter, I'm sorry, in Jude, there's only one chapter. It's, it's an odd, it's a hard to reference Jude for me because uh, there's only one chapter. So it's just Jude 21, but not like chapter 21. It's just verse 21. In Jude chapter, see, I said it again, verse 21, he says this, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. He's commanding the believers to pray in the Holy Spirit. Why? So that we can have perseverance. Praying in the Spirit allows us to have perseverance so that we may come to eternal life. In other words, we have been saved. We've talked about